What does a contraction feel like? How do I know if I'm in labor? And what does the day of labor look like? Wait, is this normal? Hey, I'm Heidi. My best friends call me Hydes. I'm a certified birth doula, host of this podcast, and author of Birth Story, an interactive pregnancy guidebook. I have supported hundreds of women through their labor and deliveries, and I believe every one of them and you deserves a microphone and a stage. So here we are. Listen each week to get answers to these tough questions. Birth Story, where we talk about pregnancy, labor, deliveries, where we tell our stories and share our feelings. And of course, chat about our favorite baby products and motherhood. And because I'm passionate about birth outcomes, you will hear from some of the top experts in labor and delivery. Whether you are pregnant, trying desperately to get pregnant, or you just love a good birth story, I hope you will stick around and be part of this birth story family. You guys, my book is out. I mean, it is out in the world. I cannot believe it. I have been writing it for several years and it's just mind blowing. Birth Story, Pregnancy Guidebook and Journal is a -a one-of-a-kind discovery into your pregnancy that provides you education through storytelling. So what's it really about? In the 16 years that I have served women with every personality type, I noticed there was a huge disconnect between what my clients were craving for childbirth education in a book and the books that were actually available on the market. There seemed to be unlimited resources. If you are looking for an unmedicated birth or a natural birth or a home birth, but there just weren't a lot of resources for my clients who were part of the 92% of women birthing in a hospital and very much open to medical interventions like an epidural, nitrous oxide, and opioid medications. So I wrote that book to fill the gap for you. Week by week throughout your pregnancy, you will engage with material meant to educate and empower you as you plan for your own birth story, hospital, medicated, unmedicated, or something in between. You are welcomed each week with a postcard from the womb, which is an adorable note from your baby about their miraculous development, as well as the amazing changes occurring within you. Then you are invited to use an uplifting birth affirmation and to respond to an introspective journaling prompt to document your feelings, curiosities, and wonders every single week. With room to memorialize your own birth story, this book will become a memory keeper and a legacy gift for your baby. You are encouraged to read one of my favorite birth stories each week filled with childbirth education, tidbits, and explanations of important medical terms and procedures. These are real-life accounts shared with permission from the births that I've attended during my career as a doula, and I gave you a great mix. In the 42-week guide to your pregnancy and 42 birth stories, seven of them end in cesarean section. About half are unmedicated and the other half are medicated deliveries. This is a judgment-free book. So take what you need from each element and leave the rest. Okay, are you ready to buy? I would love for you to go to birthstory.com and buy it directly from me. But I totally get it if you're an Amazon girl. You can head to amazon.com and just type in birth story pregnancy and the book should pop up. I'll deliver it straight to your doorstep. And I would venture to say that you might be an audiobook kind of woman because you're listening to a podcast. So if you would prefer to listen to this book, then I have recorded it and it is available for download at audible.com or on your Audible app. Thank you for being part of the birth story community. I am so excited for you to have this book in your hand once you've purchased it and it has arrived. I hope that you will give me your thoughts and feedback and don't forget to take a selfie with your book and post it on Instagram and tag at Birth Story Podcast. Episode 21. Today's episode is an international adoption story. We talk with Rochelle, and she and her husband Pete adopted two toddlers from Jenja, Uganda, in Africa. 
Originally, they just planned for one. So this is a really cool story on how they ended up with two children from the Kidron Valley Orphanage. I try to walk you through a step-by-step guide on where you might start if you're interested in international adoption and how it might go. This particular story is very near and dear to my heart as I was their adoption doula. And if you've been listening for a while, you know that I have a book coming out. A portion of the proceeds from each book sold are going to fund the teacher salaries at this beautiful orphanage in Jinja, Uganda. This story changed my life and I hope it might change yours too. So ready? Yeah, I'm ready. She can interject like, you know, when you hear a rap song and then someone's in the background, it's like Big Papa, (laughs) like she... (laughs) Junior Mafia, what? Like she could do like shout out. Yeah. Well, let's just go on that. So <laughs> Rochelle right now, we're on the Birth Story podcast and we have Rochelle that we're interviewing, but um, the Big Papa in the background <laughs> that she's referring to is my best friend, Megan, who is co-hosting. Good morning. Today for the first time. So this is really exciting. Just let's give everybody that's listening a a little background. Um, this was a little bit of a hard week for me and it was the first time I was going to be without my children for eight days, which anyone who's listening in this pregnant is probably like, could, you know, probably can't imagine that unless you have older children. But I was thinking, oh, I don't know how I'm going <laughs> to be away from my kids for eight days, which now is like, I mean, we're all having kind of a good time without kind of only minimal fun <laughs> without our children. But my bestie Megan, f- since we were ten years old from Florida, showed up on my doorstep, and there's an epic video on Instagram and Facebook of my reaction to this. So I have a co-host. Whoop, whoop. Whoop. <laughs> Who might know more than a mother of five? Come on, Big Papa. <laughs> Where's your whoop? What's whoop? a good like yes. birth word that she could? <laughs> Blurred out in the middle of every it. now and then. I just want you to say push <laughs> placenta, <laughs> push it real good. So, oh no, no. there's no singing in this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> in all seriousness, hello, everybody. Hello, uh, on the podcast today, we are talking adoption. And what's really cool is I happen to have been Rochelle's doula for her birth, and her birth story is going to be featured in my book that's coming out. And so I'm really excited about that. But after she had two babies, she went on to adopt two more. So we have tons of questions for you. And we really want to honor all the ways in which we become parents, including through adoption. And so welcome. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. I will say we've already had our coffee. It's like really early in the morning and we've already had our coffee. We're pretty amped up here. We've worked out. We're having a pretty good mom day. Yeah. You know? Winning. Rochelle, let's start at the very beginning. My beginning of this story was sitting on your couch, nursing our babies, and I was like, oh, are you going to have another one? What did I say? You were, well, you were kind of already deep into the adoption. Like I just kind of was getting caught up. Yeah. And so... Start us at the very beginning. Did you always know you wanted to adopt? I I did not. Um, I'd say the very beginning would be when, I'm sure you'll remember, we traveled back and forth to Africa doing ambassadors in sport. And when we went back the second time and had Pete with us, we went to that one orphanage that had the little boy with the Vuvuzela. And every time he kicked the soccer ball, he would blow it. And I think that really was the first time Pete and I started talking about orphans and adoption and what it might look like to adopt from Africa. I guess I should have probably started there. So Rochelle and I were, can I call ourselves international soccer players? I think it's fair. Yeah. Yeah. So we played on an international soccer team. Oh, Uh, we did play a national team. I don't remember who it was, but I scored on them. No, we played against the women's national national team team in South Africa. Yeah. I know this is a birth story podcast, but this all is relevant. So Rochelle and I were international soccer players. We went and played with ambassadors in sport. And a year later, Mm -hmm. after when we had worked in all of these orphanages and some prisons, prisons. were just kind of covered in children. It was such a a good way to say it. Yeah. I mean, it was really an amazing, you'd walk into an orphanage and they were just 
Yeah. We were covered in children. It was so beautiful. I mean, they just wanted to touch our skin and our hair was so different. They would chant me next or me now. I can't remember. And they'd want to just keep jumping on you. And there was like a hundred lined up waiting to just touch and be held and and so I was wondering if it was on the first trip or the second trip. So a year later... The seed was probably planted early. Yeah, I was going to say, I feel like you were kind of in your you were in your groove. And yeah. a year later, we decided to come back, but we decided to bring like everyone we knew yes, that it was played soccer. Epic. It was kind of epic because it was the 2010 World oh, Cup. Oh yeah, it was also World Cup. Let's not... Yeah, I was mm-hmm. like, it was 2010 World Cup. So we kind of went back to South Africa with all of our soccer playing friends on that trip. On the way there, oh, tell yeah, everybody I got engaged. What yeah, it was the best day. We always joke. We're like, not the wedding, not having kids. It was the best day of my life because in that same day, we got engaged in Madrid on like I don't know what you call that a layover, a very long layover. It was a day long layover, and then I remember arriving and everybody was already at the stadium and we came to m- meet you guys and we were like totally done up with all the face paint and I just remember you being like twenty rows up yelling Michelle and you were like wanting and I held up my hand with the ring I and you were like see yes it. I was like yes and, and then, then Landon Donovan scored the most amazing goal ever I was like wait we cannot do this podcast without honoring Landon Donovan's no, we goal cannot. we should have um, named our first. Landon. Oh, it was such an incredible, it it was such an incredible soccer match in overtime. It was, I mean, I don't think my body has ever shook. It was the most amazing thing ever. And if you're not a soccer fan, you're probably like, what are you talking about? So on this trip, you, we went to this one particular orphanage and I, we have some pictures I'll put up on our Instagram and Facebook feed of this little boy with the Vuvuzela. Yeah. I have his picture hanging in our house. Um, oh, it was just so incredible. And we did a lot of dancing and a lot yes. of singing and a lot of playing and a lot of touching and a lot of holding yep. with many orphans. And so the seed was kind of planted. Yep. So did you guys start talking about it or was it just kind of in your hearts Um, As you planned your wedding and having kids. No, we actually did start talking about it. It was funny because that was one thing that always excited me or drew me to Pete was the fact that he wasn't scared to talk about serious things. Like before being engaged, you know, we talked about having kids and the possibility of adoption. And then once we really, you know, committed to each other and knew we were getting married, we full on discussed, you know, what our family would look like often. And I think we knew from the start, even when having Brecken, that we were going to adopt down the road. So did you always know that you wanted to have biological children first and then adopt next? No, but I do think once we had Brecken, I knew I wanted to have one more at least before we adopted. Okay. Was Brecken a planned pregnancy your first? Yes. Okay. So you have Brecken. How old is he? Seven. And then you have another? Tuck. And how old is he? The old Tuckster. He is five. Okay. Seven and five. How old were they when you decided we are going to go for adoption rather than another biological child? I think almost four and almost two. Okay. So I guess that's three and one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's a fancy way to say it. So when they were three and one, sometime around there, we were sitting on the couch. Yes. Taking care of our babies. And... You know, of course, I asked the question no one should ever ask, like, when are you having another baby? Like, right <laughs> after the question no one should ever ask. <laughs> yes. When you are, nursing. but Heidi will ask it. <laughs> yes. So when you're holding, are you having another one? Yeah, I did ask that, and you were like, actually, we have started the adoption process. Look at us. So what is that? I, I mean, oh. take me on that. I don't even know. Like, how do you, what do you do? Okay. Do you call somebody? Do you get on the Googles? We, exa- all the, all the things, all the technologies. We, um, knew that we wanted to adopt. So we started researching and we found out that a lot of the places, like a lot of countries in Africa were closed down to adoption or it was really limited. Like you could only adopt kids above a certain age or with special needs. So at first we had to whittle it down or figure out which countries were viable options to adopt from because we did want to adopt at least with the first, um, a younger child. And so we found out that it was between Uganda and Ethiopia. And ironically, we were like, we'll go with Uganda because it's a shorter timeline. And then all of the laws changed. You'll hear about that midway through. Um, so, so at the time, it was easier to adopt yes, from, from Uganda, Uganda than it was from Ethiopia. But Correct. for the whole continent of yeah. Africa, Americans uh-huh, could at adopt the time. from like Ghana, South Africa, Ethiopia, Uganda, and there might have been one more. But all the other places um, had to be special needs children of a certain age okay. or above, and those were longer timelines as well. 
Okay. So as soon as we knew it was Uganda, we started looking for adoption agencies that had a program for Uganda. And so the very first one I found that I really liked and had looked over um, all the information on the webpage had a webinar that night when I was looking and I was like, oh my gosh, like, let's check this out tonight. So okay. I remember logging in and Pete and I like nerdily sitting up against the laptop, like listening and asking questions here and there. And we pretty much got all of our questions answered. And there were other families on the, is that even the right word? Now it might be like a Moodle or it was a webinar, I think. And then at the end of it, we closed the computer and talked a little, went to bed. And the next morning we're like, so you ready to do it? And we're both like, yep. And so I just called and started the process, which is a lengthy one because, you know, there's a lot of paperwork. And the very first thing we had to start on immediately was our home study. So that takes about four to six months to do a home study where you have like a social worker who comes and visits your home. There's tons of like background checks and they want to, you know, meet your children and learn about everyone that's in the household and what your values are. And you write like an autobiography about your family and you trace back your own history of like how you grew up and what your parenting beliefs are and Mm. all this stuff. There's a lot of psychology involved in it. Yes. Okay. So let's pause, rewind. If someone is listening to this podcast and they have a seed inside of them for adoption, Mm -hmm. what would you recommend be the starting point, regardless of where they're going to adopt? But we're specifically addressing international adoption today. So where would someone start? The very How do you get to a webinar? Yeah, the very first thing you're going to have to do is go online and find um, different agencies that would be a good fit for you. And so some are religion-based and some aren't, and some are, like ours happen to be local and was within our state. But you really can adopt, like if you had, you know, you were East Coast and you saw a California adoption agency that met all of the needs, they had a program you liked and you lined up with the values and the timelines looked good, you, you could still use them. Okay. And so you really just need to find an agency that has the program you're looking for. So like I say that because ours, um, our agency ended up at, adding two other countries like Burundi is one they just added. And so it's always changing like the countries that you can adopt from. Let's play a game. Oh. Where in the world is Burundi? <gasps> Who knows? Um, Tell I'm, me. I'm going to take a guess it's in Africa, but I, I don't mean, know I, which part. <laughs> North, east? South, East, Question? West, Middle? I've got a one out of four chance East. I was just wondering how smart we were at this very Oh, we're that's not. All. That's not. Push button over here. We all just did a thumbs down. <laughs> So the first step would be find an adoption agency. With the adoption agency, like I'm assuming you have to have a lawyer. Okay. Does the lawyer... Like me personally? Yeah. Or did the agency... I didn't have to have a lawyer. You didn't have to have a lawyer. No, but really the first thing I did, sorry, that was like a lie. I talked to other people who had adopted um, and really picked their brain about certain things and what the home study was going to be like and things like that. Then I went and found an agency. We did not have a lawyer. Um, I just, you end up getting a social worker and like a case manager. Oh, okay. It feels like something legal to feels me. Feels very legal. But yeah. see, this is good. This is why we're doing the podcast. It's not as legal as gets legal later. Okay. <laughs> later. Say that five times fast. Legal later. Legal later. Legal later. later. <laughs> I can't do Come it. Come on, Megan. Say it. <laughs> Push. <laughs> <laughs> this is so good. Okay. So Placenta. step one in international adoption, find mentorship, a tribe, a group, maybe like on Facebook or Instagram, follow some hashtags, yeah, get a definitely. group of people that can talk to you yes, about what their sure. experience was like. Um, later I'm going to ask you, are you now a mentor for other people? But we're on this podcast, so I guess the answer is yes. <laughs> um, then get on Google and or, or Yahoo or whatever you're And you can being, ask the people you've talked to. Choice. Like people suggested the one that I was researching. Okay. That's always like a really credible yes. source yes. for um, referrals. But find an agency that fits you. Yes, because there's so many nuances and little things you have to know, and only an agency is going to be able to tell you all of those things. And then what I heard from you was buckle down and prepare for months of paperwork and home study. And they tell you that, and you think you know it, but it's really difficult because your end game and goal is like you want to adopt this child. And it's almost like for at least six months, you can't even really consider... Are they alive? Have they been born yet? Yes, you don't even know. You know? So what was the age range that you were um, desiring to adopt? We applied for birth to two. 
birth to two. And, and did they, you care about the sex no. of the baby? So that is, they ask you all these different questions and that goes into your home study. So they ask if you want multiple siblings, what gender, are you okay with disabilities? And we said, yes, we're okay with disabilities, birth to two. I think we might have specified that we prefer to male, but we're open. Okay. So then... What happens if you're doing international? When you're done, like four to six months of this home study and this you work, celebrate. Yeah. Um, no, then soon, what happens as soon as you're done? You know, if it's going to be international, then you need to immediately start getting all of your documents. Um, there's two things for immigration because you need to get approved to be able to bring a child home. And at this point, I've literally black. It's almost like birth. I've blacked it all out. There, I don't remember the form numbers and all that, but there's forms you fill out and you get approval. And at the same time, you submit something called a dossier, which is basically the fact that your home study is done. They submit many copies, uh, notarized copies of your home study, along with a gazillion documents of like your finances and your background checks. And depending what country, like ours, you know, religion was a part of the criteria. Like you had to have a letter from your pastor and things like that. Okay. Oh, I have so many questions. When did you have to pay money to someone first? Because I know adoption is <laughs> um, not free, but like, do you like so right away have to pay this the agency home study, money? You do have to pay. And that money went directly to the, like the social workers, not company, but like wherever they worked out of. Okay. You had to pay. And I want to say that was like two to three hundred dollars. Um, so not anything huge compared to what you would later pay. And, and I want you to break that down for us because I want to be able to set realistic expectations yeah. for people that are listening on the financial. And then we. So the real reason like it would be great to start with the agency is because they will send you a breakdown from start to finish with a timeline of how much it is total, but like what each part's spent on and when it's due by. You know, adoption can cost even domestically anywhere from 20 grand to 40 grand total. But then when you're going international and you incorporate travel, it can be around 60 thousand okay. dollars. And then if you have multiple, like for us when we decided to adopt Priscilla, it just essentially doubled it, minus a few things that you only pay one time. So that- okay. So we'll get to the money stuff later, but just like, let's kind of throw it out there overall, <laughs> start to finish. What did it end up costing to adopt two children from Uganda? A guess for me that's pretty close would probably be eighty five to 90000 Okay, and that includes all your plane tickets and everything. Uh, that includes everything. I'd say the actual fees would probably have been maybe like fifty to sixty thousand, but then all the flights and the court and like we had to pay to foster them, so we paid money every month. Yeah. Because you had to foster them for a certain period of time. So yeah. you had to pay for like all of their food, um, clothes, medical education. Education all school, that. yeah. Okay, so take a deep breath, everybody that just heard that number, right? Because um, Rochelle, what do you do for a living? Um, I'm in education. And what does your husband do for a living? He's in social work and nonprofit. Okay, so a teacher and a nonprofit social worker found a way to get eighty-five to ninety thousand dollars to bring their two beautiful children home. And one of the things I want to talk about later in the podcast is creative and generous fundraising. Yes, please don't um, let money stop you. If you want to do it, it will not be an issue. The money will come. I was going to say, that's just one the thing I want come. to ring to is from, I'm like on the outside, you know, I've never adopted, but being part of watching you guys do this is watching people show up with generosity and um, wanting to really contribute to make this possible for anyone, yes. regardless of what your baseline uh, finances Yes, are. I want to emphasize that. Do not let money be... Yeah. The restriction or the reason you don't do it. So well, let's go get to the good stuff. So oh the my. home study's done. Yes. And at what point did you know it was going to be Uganda and oh possibly gosh. like, how did that matching? You're taking me back now to places I have not traveled in a while in my mind. So, oh, which interject, you mentioned earlier that this is kind of like being pregnant and birth. And let's honor that for anyone who is adopting or has adopted and has never given birth. It is so similar. similar yes. Like the the process of trying to get pregnant and then the process of being pregnant. And the joy and of being never, matched is like finding out you have, you are pregnant and like what the sex is. And, and never knowing what day you're going to go into labor. Or, or what the what outcome you, will even be. Exactly. It, there are so many parallels to the adoption process yes. to just labor. It's like becoming a parent 
is becoming a parent, parent yep. and it's a it's a journey, you know, and Correct. It, and it looks very different for everybody. But there are so many parallels. I know you said you've blacked out some no, of I, it. I've, it's coming back slowly, okay. but surely. So here's Drink what some happened more next. Yep. I'm just going to keep keep going with the coffee. So they um, this is what they say they do. And I remember being like, Pfft how could they really do this? And I was telling someone this the other day. It's so funny. They take your autobiography, like the story you wrote about your life and your family. And then they have for us in our agency, they had five different orphanages that they worked with in Uganda. And they said, we're putting your um, story out there to these different places. And they know what kids they have available right now. And they try very hard to make a really great match between family and child. And I thought, birth to two, like, how are you going to, I feel like it's a little like just throwing, you know, a dart at a board like, oh, we'll give them this kid. But I really cannot emphasize how well they do this because not only do I feel like our, the child they referred us was a perfect match for our family, but also all the families I met adopting and their children. I was like, oh, my gosh, like it makes perfect sense. Like that child goes so perfectly with that family and probably, you know, wouldn't have been the best fit in our family. And so I don't know how they do that, but they referred us a child. But their little personalities yes. come out so so true so quickly. Because could you see Jordan really with any other family? I mean, no. Mm-mm. We're going to get to Jordan in oh, a little Jordan. bit. In that little Spitfire personality. <laughs> Let's talk about when you like. So the, these five orphanages get your yeah. information and they make the match. Now, how did you find out that they? Yeah matched you. So there's a lot of conversation between the agency and your caseworker who knows you so well at this point and the orphanage, like the person that runs it and makes those decisions. They wrote me and said, hey, we've been talking with this one orphanage that has the perfect match for you. And they said it could be any time in the next few weeks that we're going to email you your referral. And basically what that is, is kind of like when you go and you find out the sex of your child, like they tell you who the child is, they send you a picture and then they give you all the like medical background or any information they have on the child and their story of like how they came to the orphanage. Okay. So you're like, this is happening. So I remember being at school and I was like, oh my gosh, I think an email is coming in. I was like, not sure if I wanted to check it because I wasn't with Pete. And then of course I did check it. And then it said, meet Jordan Mukisa. And I was like, oh. Should I click on it? I do want to meet Jordan Mukiza. And the second I clicked on it and saw that little booger, I was just like, oh, my gosh. It's like it all becomes so real right then. Yeah. Yeah. And so they sent you a current photo. Oh, let me. This is all so funny because let's go back to we requested birth to two. So they really need to refer you a child. And and keep in mind, the older a child gets, the less likely they are to be adopted. So really orphanages know the niche or like this little time period is in the first two to three years that they can probably really get the child adopted to a family. And so if a child were to be, and it's all real loosey goosey, there's no like birth certificates or whatever. But if a child could be less than 24 months old, then they match your home study paperwork and the immigration paperwork that you have, and you can bring them home. But if a child were to be referred to you and it said 26 months old, you can't bring that child home because you weren't approved for someone over two at referral. Okay. So uh, Jordan, they told us, was right under that two-year-old mark, luckily. And so we're really unsure exactly how old he was, but we got pictures that were fairly current, and then we knew he was somewhere around like a year and 10 months old. Okay. Now let's address this. Does he really not have a birth certificate? No. Oh, great question, push button. Let's start with push. push. You mentioned earlier that there was no birth certificate. It is very antiquated there. So you don't know his actual birthday and age. Correct. Like most kids there, there are no formal documents and they do a lot of like, we know they were born in the last rainy season. And you're like, okay, great. That's a range. Um, So with him, I actually think his birthday was pretty spot on because he was abandoned a few days after birth. So they could pretty much pinpoint it. But like with Priscilla, it was, you know, not a random guess in the dark. But I mean, I think we're off by many months. Okay. So let's talk about Jordan's birth story. Like, okay. what do we know about what Jordan's life was like before you got this email with a picture of him? I think that's the hardest part. Um, we don't know a lot. He was abandoned on a Sunday in a little patch of grass by the stairs of this very tiny church in Buganda, not to be confused with 
Uganda. It was Buganda in Uganda. And um, they heard a baby crying and they all come out, you know, after service and there was nobody there. Fast forward a little bit. I went to visit this place and stood in the exact patch of grass holding Jordan that he had been abandoned in. And it was the most powerful moment for me. I went around the whole town and took pictures. And when we were standing there, this group of women was cooking around a fire and ran over. And they were the women that were there that originally found him that day and were asking, is this Jordan? And wanted to see him and hold him. And so, you know, they do everything they can. Newspaper ads, they, I'm I'm saying it's old school. They go around like a megaphone in a van with a picture of him and ask everyone in the town and surrounding areas, but nobody came forward. Um, And so the pastor ended up taking him into his home, which did not end up being a good thing. Let's talk a little bit about birth statistics in Uganda. Like what are some of the possibilities of why there are so many orphans in Uganda? And like what, if we can speculate or guess as to what happened to Jordan's mom and dad or mom or dad, then what that might be. And it's so hard because the one thing I remember them telling us, um, you do also just side note for you guys that want to adopt, you have to take a certain number of hours of classes online. And I remember them saying like, so I'll speculate, but when you're talking to the child, they said never give, only stick to facts. Don't ever tell them something about their parents that you're not 100% positive of. And so I really don't know anything, but it could be possible that the mom and dad were not together and that the mom could not handle, because of illness or money raising the child, it could have had something to do with a lot of people hide their pregnancy. And then there's like a sense of shame um, around getting pregnant and having a child. So if they can hide it and then get rid of the child, no one would really know. I was going to read some stuff here. Oh, please. I did some research. You did research? Well, yeah, because we're going to get to some future stuff. Let's stick with some facts at this day and time in our social landscape. Well, let's just talk a little bit. And again, I'm opening up my book, Birth Story. Oh. That's coming out. That's not what that is. But um, Uganda's maternal mortality rate is one of the highest in the world. One woman out of every 49 do not survive their pregnancy and or their delivery. I believe that, yep. 33% of girls will give birth by the time they're 18 years old. 100% believe that. of the population is infected with malaria each year with over a thousand deaths. Uh, Both of your children had had malaria malaria multiple times. More than one time, yeah, while I was there. And your husband. And my husband, yeah. Multiple times, but thankfully they were able to get treatment. Yeah. Um, But there are 11,000 deaths in Uganda a year. Yeah, you need to get treated immediately. Yeah, so 6% of the population is HIV positive. Yep. Most of Ugandans make less than a thousand dollars overall, even with when you include the big cities, a thousand yep. a month. Um, the average salary at the particular orphanage that you have adopted from Kidron Valley is eighty U.S. dollars per month. If you're a teacher, yep, and the caregivers are less. Yeah. So these are just some of the reasons there are two and a half. I was going to say it's the orphan capital of the world. Yeah. It's 2.5 million, million. I think. 2.5 mm-hmm. million orphans. And so we don't know what happened to Jordan's mom. Mm-hmm. But there you are standing outside this church on that patch of grass, like holding your son and the women in the village are coming around you. And at this point, they know that they're happy. And I'm they're assuming so they're celebrating with you that this and little you know, yes. baby that they were concerned about now is on his way home. Yep. You and know? you know, Jordan, he's the life of everything, <laughs> every yeah. party, every day. And he just starts like giggling and dancing. And it was just this really joyful moment. And to see where he had gone, because I think, I know, you know, he was eight and a half pounds at almost a year and a half old. And he really looked like a malnourished newborn when he was a year and a half, but was not fed regularly. And so the equivalent of DSS in their village. And they came and saw the state Jordan was in and took him. And he was on the brink of death. Yes. At this point. And he was somehow taken to the hospital or was he taken to the He was uh, given to the police who brought him immediately to Kidron. And they sent me before the actual arrival of Jordan and Priscilla in the U.S., 
they sent me this um, photo album of all these pictures from the first day they took him in all the way throughout the years that I had never seen because it was before I knew Jordan and it was all it was like the missing piece of the puzzle like I got to see his life for the first two years so that he slowly started to be able to sit up. But when he was one and a half, two years old, he was just getting the strength to sit and have core strength and stand. He couldn't walk when I first met him and he was almost two. Because at first he was abandoned. Next, he was completely neglected. Yep. And then he was brought to the orphanage and slowly nursed back to health. Okay. So we kind of jumped all around. Didn't we though? Yeah, I know. Push. I would like to know, yes, your first meeting with him. You know, like, oh I'm like my waiting gosh. for that. Like you're- So we arrive in Uganda. I mean, first let's talk about, it is a day to two days of traveling, many, many flights, all eight hours to here, eight hours to that. You look disgusting. You finally arrive. But you left your kids at home, right? It's yes. just you and your husband? Oh yeah, what kids? Yeah, okay. uh, we're all on our own. <laughs> Great time. And we arrive in um, Kampala, which is where you have to fly in in Uganda because there's one international airport. And then we're still three hours away from Jinja. So Big John, um, who leads the whole mission, is the one that picks you up. And he is just the best thing ever. And You called him Big John. I met him as Pastor, Pastor John. John. Yes. <laughs> he first, we, I don't call him Big John, but that's like how all of his emails to me. He's like, hello, I am Big John. I'll be the one picking you up. And um, <laughs> he's the best thing ever. We ran, hugged him. And in all honesty, knowing him now and remembering the first trip, we get in the car and start driving and... Uganda is all red clay and bumpy roads. Nothing's paved. And so we're like, and there's no um, seat belts. We're like jostling all around. He is driving like 90 miles per hour, barely missing people on the side of the road. And then like he gets some phone call, which they all have cell phones. And he's like, sounds angry, angrily talking with man whose car he's driving. Then the car breaks down. We're in the middle of this city in the middle of the night with people like swarming the car. And it was so funny. So finally we drive the three hours. We get to where John lives. We sleep a little because it's like the middle of the night. And when we wake up in the morning, he takes us to the orphanage which is this bright yellow building. And we come around the corner and they all are pointing and saying, Jordan's in there. Hey, it's Heidi. I'm interrupting the podcast to let you know about a free resource that I've created for you at birthstory.com. All you have to do is go to birthstory.com and then click the tab that says the workbook. Once you put your email address in, an entire resource library of all of my secret sauces are available to you for free as my thank you for listening to the Birth Story podcast and being part of this community. At birthstory.com, under the workbook, you will find a birth plan template, articles on circumcision, delayed cord clamping, flipping a breech baby, packing your hospital bag, acupressure points, placenta encapsulation, and so much more. There are over 20 free articles ready for you to download at birthstory.com. Now let's get back to this amazing episode. We walk around the corner and Jordan comes like toddling, crawling, falling into my lap with the most insane giggle, like contagious, awesome laughter and just rolled all over me. And it was like the best moment ever. And I just thought he was so, and little did we know if I look back at pictures of it, that Priscilla was sitting directly next to him, eating porridge, looking at us the whole time. The whole time. <sighs> okay. So can I, can I ask what the time frame was? I'm so excited. Push, pushed her uh-huh. button. <laughs> what the from, time frame from when you got the email that you replaced with the child to when you had your first visit over? Oh, so that what? part's awesome. It was really like three weeks. Oh, wow. Mm-hmm. Okay. Like we went immediately after getting the referral. Okay. Because it had been over a year. Yeah, since at this the point. Process mm-hmm. started, right? Yeah. So from. From the time you said, oh, I want to adopt to the time you landed in Uganda was yes. over a year. And good question, Megan, because side note, right as we were accepting and then we're meeting him is when the law changed. And all of a sudden they were saying we were supposed to go on one trip and meet him and then and stay for a few weeks and then come back and do the court process and bring him home. Well, right as soon as we had been referred and met him and knew he was ours, they said, now you have to the law change. You have to foster him for a year before you can even think about going to court. Like, so you're about, you've met this bubbly, cute, smiley Jordan and he's yours and you're there with him and you're supposed to bring him home. The next time. Yeah. 
And then they're like, oh, Surprise. sorry. I'm sorry you've paid all this thousands and of dollars. And now I realize why everyone said international adoption, well, adoption in general, is like this crazy roller coaster ride. So you I'm be assuming that you had a decision. Like you Correct. could be like. We could have ended the referral. Deal. Sorry, Jordan. Reverse. You're yep. not. We're not going to do this. There was no way that was happening. But yes. Or you could have stuck it out, which yeah. is what you guys did. Changed my life. Yep. So you decided that you were going to adhere to this new law. Yep. And foster your child in country yep. for an entire year. Yep. And then you could start the paperwork process. <laughs> Best thing that ever happened to us. Yeah. And the most painful news to ever receive. But yep. Yep. Um, We did it. You hung out with him. Yep. And he played. So we had him for this whole first week. And it was not like, I don't want to paint a picture of it being blissful and perfect. It was, we played. It was so much fun. And then, you know, reality sets in. They, like, you literally go and have brought diapers, clothes, medicine in case he gets sick. And then they just hand him to you with a few pairs of scraggly, you know, like ripped clothes from the orphanage and are like, here you go. And so all of a sudden, 24 seven, you have this child and you're staying in a new surrounding. Because you place. leave the orphanage. You leave the you're orphanage. Correct. at the orphanage with him. You nope. take him away from the orphanage. Correct. And we stay, oh my gosh, I can't remember what they call it. It was Pastor John's like guest house area. And yeah, I mean, everything's different there, right? Like we didn't have a mode of transportation and we don't know how to get places and we don't speak the language. We don't look like everybody else. So, I mean, it's a lot of new being thrown at you. And then you have this child who's so happy and it's so exciting. But then I'm like, oh my gosh, is he potty trained? Is he like, what can he do? What can't he do at night? He's got these tantrums and rituals that I think he was used to doing to like soothe himself to sleep. And now you've got this woman offering to hold you and rock you. And I just remember, you know, I think it's uh, good to be transparent the first few nights, many times as I'm like rocking him and he's crying and I'm thinking, did I make a mistake? Like, what if he doesn't love me? What if he doesn't feel that connection? Like, was all of this for nothing? And, and then you realize, no, silly. Yeah. It's just hard. Yeah. Mm. How long did you stay in country the first time? Uh, I think three weeks. Wow. So you were with him for three weeks. Yes. And then because of this new law, you had to, to take go. him back oh, to the orphanage. Yeah, leaving and, and them ripping him, he would not let go. And bawling and the sound of his crying when we had to leave was the most painful thing I've ever done. Because and that repeated to, every time we visited. I'm going to say, because you had to drive back to the orphanage. Correct. And you had to... Like, and then leave. what message is that sending him, right? Like... He's totally attached and been with us and feels safe. And were you asked, you were, you were saying mommy and daddy and, Mm -hmm. you know, like like I'm mommy, this is daddy. with Jordan, he was, I mean, not to sound boastful, but he was obsessed with me. He swatted Pete away (laughs) and he called me mama immediately and didn't want to be, I think you guys know he was almost two, but he really looked like a 10 month old. Like you would hold him. He was the size of a little baby and he would not do anything. Like he would not, it was always we had to force him to try to start learning to walk and stuff because all he wanted to do was sit on in my lap or on me and never wanted to be apart. So then just taking him held. back. Did you have a baby carrier or anything mm-hmm. that you had just to carry yep. him in and just be? I literally skin? never put him down or had him off of me that first trip. Yeah. Amazing. Now, one of the things I want you to share is they don't have traditional formula. So he was fed. Um, I wish I could even remember. It was like glucose and margarine it? or something. Yeah. So they had to It's make, not nutritional. So they didn't, you know, and there weren't wet nurses at the orphanage. And so right. um, they were, when he was first there, the bottles that they're given. I mean, this is a big need is what I'm trying Correct. to say. Like huge need. It's a huge need to be able to fundraise money for these orphanages, to be yes. able to supply something as simple as And it doesn't formula. take a lot of money. Yeah, because they're right now the children are getting these like sugar water butter right. yes. bottles that just really something aren't. that fills them. But like, let's think, what do we know? Everything that's important in a child's life comes in the first few years, and so much of their brain and everything, you know, language, all these things are formed in the beginning. And when they're not getting adequate nutrition, think of what that does to their potential in life, right? right? And we always talk about like one small change, right? Like one small change that we can make as a tribe of people mm-hmm. coming together. Is to be able to supply nutrition to I mean, so fundamental, right? Like everyone deserves infants and children, and that can change the world. So we're going to get a little bit more to the finances um, in the end, but I want to jump ahead a little bit. So this ritual of going back and forth, 
then began because you had a whole year. So you had to then start going separate, right? Yes, because we needed to maintain jobs to pay for the adoption and we couldn't just. And your other two children. And we had to raise two children, yep. So you started going alone, then your husband Pete started going alone, and you guys started going every few months. Yeah. So that you could go see Jordan, still build those relationships. Yeah. On one of those trips, I was able to come with you. Yeah. And so I want to talk a little bit about our time together and how one became two. Oh, yes. So right before I joined you in Uganda, just as a, you know, a friend and a support person that since your husband couldn't go, different friends were trading back and forth on these trips. And you had found out that you could adopt a second child. Yes. And that you was never really on the table. So now we're in this long waiting period, but there's a light. Yes. It's, oh, you can add on. So, it's a BOGO. BOGO. But it wasn't get one free. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so tell me about what that conversation looked like with you and Pete. Yeah, we met this amazing couple that we will forever be entwined with um, who was adopting two of Jordan and Priscilla's good friends and happened to be there at the same time as me on that trip and had added on, they were originally adopting one. And so when I started questioning them, like, oh, how did you end up with the second? They said, oh, we're originally adopting this one. And then we found out that we could, within a certain time period, add on a second. And so I started having that idea swirling in my mind, and I brought it up to Pete. And now I'm there without Pete. And so I think right about the time you were arriving, I was realizing that maybe adopting Priscilla, because it would be on the same timeline, like... John let me know that if we did it, you know, within a certain, like right from the beginning and didn't wait six months that we could probably have Jordan and Priscilla um, go through the process together. And so I sent him a picture of me holding Priscilla and said, what do you think? And he said, she's beautiful. Oh my gosh. But I really want to adopt Priscilla. And I said, that is Priscilla. She just has dreads this time instead of cornrows. And like every time you went, her hair would be different. So like you could never tell he, he, I was like, that is Priscilla. That is so funny because she had gotten bigger, Yes, you know, and her hair was different and she was changing from day one on your first trip. You had mentioned Priscilla was always next to Jordan. Yes. Like, so when you look back at every pictures and from these nurses that took them in at the beginning, Jordan and Priscilla later, we link back, we're always together, always always next to each other. Sleeping like an inch from each other. Yep. At all times. Always holding hands. And Jordan attached to you very quickly. Yes. But on that very first trip, Priscilla had attached. Obsessed with Pete. To Pete. Yes. And so when you kind of found out... It was on the table. Yeah. It was, if we could do this, we don't know how financially we're going to do this, yep. but let's do this. Which right? again is where I say, don't worry about the money because I didn't. Yeah. Tell us about Priscilla's given name. Oh, Docus. And what does that mean? Um, blessing from the sugar cane. Okay. Because she was abandoned in a sugar cane plantation when she was maybe eight or nine months was the guess. But they weren't. But we don't know. No, for And sure. again, no birth certificate or... So you and Pete ended up having to to pick a birthday for Priscilla yes. and then pick a birthday for Jordan yeah. based on these like guest timelines. Her given name was Docus, but everyone but at the orphanage her. called her Priscilla Correct. and everyone called Jordan Jordan. Correct. His a given name was? Jordan Mukisa. Um, well, most kids had an um, English name and an African name, but for okay. some reason Jordan didn't. So you had... Priscilla and Jordan, and you didn't have to change their names because right. they those were their given English, you know. Yeah, and they already had been going by them. And one thing I was always saying when you were asking Megan about meeting Jordan for the first time, like one of my first memories is just every caregiver came out and was like, they called him Jordani, and they would yell Jordani, and they sang this song, Tumbala, Tumbala, and it, they, he would try to walk to them. And he just responded so happily to the chance of his name. I was like, I'm not going to change His name and Priscilla was pretty much the same way. And just so you guys know, they also assign a mama to each baby. And so his was Juliet. And she was just like this amazing light in his life that I think really helped. And these mamas are very young women. Yes. From 
uh, either they were previous orphans and had grown up at Kidron and were never adopted and then came to work at the orphanage, right? Yeah. Or they were from a walk- walkable distance. Yes. Or, and, and they ended, ended up, up living, living there. there. Yep. Okay. So the, and these are the women that make uh, $80 or less. Uh, yeah. I want to say it's like 50 for them. Per month. Per month. Yeah. Okay. So I land in Uganda. So you are already in country. Yes. You're with another one of our friends. And, and, and you're switched off. Our friend Jess and I kind of literally switched places the at the airport. Like the plane I flew in on, I think she was flying out. out on. Again, it was very late at night. And I remember thinking, I guess... I, you know, some people would be scared or something. I mean, my husband was like, if you get normal kidnapped, little people might be, scared. we don't pay ransoms, you know? Yeah. And I, it just didn't even cross my mind. The second I landed in Uganda, I felt so safe. I felt so close to God. I felt mm-hmm. such peace, even on that rocky, yep. you know, broken down Jeep yep. ride. It was amazing. Same story. We get a little bit of sleep. So we went back first thing in the morning to get them. And I just wanted to tell a little bit of perspective. So I was, oh God, 37 years old, 36, 36, 37, something. This is just a few years ago, (laughs) you know, so I was like 36 or 37 and I walked into the orphanage and every single child that came running up to me said, Grandma, grandmother. <laughs> I do not remember this. Grandmother. And I was dying because at the time <laughs> I had a one or two year old that I had left to like go on this trip. And I'm like, grandmother, I am a, I am a brand new mother. But if we go back to the statistics that we talked about yep. earlier in Uganda, by all means, yep. I was Late 30s, grandma. I was for sure grandma, could have been a great grandma, and definitely was had only a few years left to live. I mean, basically. Yeah, your life's basically over. <laughs> my, life, my Ugandan life was basically over. That's so sad. The first thing <laughs> that I noticed we didn't talk about is that the children were in no underwear or diapers. They were trying to be potty trained, but most of the kids would just go and kind of like squat in the bush to be potty trained. And they yeah. were all in extra large tattered clothes and no gender separation of clothing at all all the boys could have been in a dress i mean there was a lot of boys in dresses it was clothes are clothes there were no like girl clothes and boy clothes Mm -hmm. and i just wanted to say that that it's just that is a harsh reality that we need to face right like Clothes are clothes to protect our bodies. Yep. And when you are in a poor country in an orphanage, you're you could care less you about could what care they care less. Yes. Right. And having something like a diaper or underwear is a super privilege. And I remember coming back from Uganda thinking, I have never worked a day in my life. Yeah, I was gonna say, what I, did you think? Right. Because these women were washing those clothes over and over. over repeatedly in one day while hanging them, yeah. changing the kids, feeding them, taking care of. I mean, it's the most amazing. Spit up porridge, pee, poop. Mm-hmm. And they are hand scrubbing on these boards. Bent over in the hot sun. Yeah. With a baby on their back. Yeah. Nursing one baby on the front of them. Yeah. And doing the laundry. Correct. Happily singing. Yeah. Happy. And I remember thinking, I am never going to complain about doing laundry again because I don't do laundry. My washing machine does laundry. Exactly. There was just a few life changing kind of pivots. And we had mm-hmm. certainly, you know, been in Africa a couple of times and seen poverty, but it was a little bit to a different level. It was I feel just like such there. a different level. Yep. The kids at this particular orphanage were very well taken care of. Yes. They were very well loved. They were very well fed. Their uh, school was taken care of because there was a school there in the facility. Yeah. So it's called Kidron Valley Orphanage. Mm -hmm. And there's a medical facility on site, too. Yeah. And And a lot of land so they can grow food. Yeah. And Pastor John, we actually went out uh, to the sweet potato farm. And again, we're international we, soccer players and farmers now. Yes, no, farmers. And we were wearing sandals. Yep, that's, we learned something. Pay no mind to that. <laughs> yes. The other women were barefoot, though, without shirts on, and again, nursing their babies with another baby on their back while picking 
sweet potatoes. And I'm True. thinking. And pretty happy. So happy. So full of It was joy. a beautiful view there. I remember that. And the sunset was pink and it was awesome. Oh my. It was just the fruit tasted like no fruit you've ever had before. Yes, the pineapple. Freshly, like, and bananas, like, freshly picked. I mean, one of the most beautiful countries I have ever been to. Yeah, and how do you describe it? I mean, it was, like, valleys and mountains and hills and jungles and, jungle, and banana trees. And, and the Nile River mm-hmm. running through all of it with beautiful, like, rock formations and waterfalls. Yeah. I mean, absolutely stunning country. So while we're there, you are wrestling with the decision of what to do. And we go to church on Sunday morning. Um, Cause again, <laughs> pastor John kind of does it all right. Like yep, he's, he's, a, he's, a he's a pastor. pastor. He's like, and I remember pulling up and thinking, Wh- where's, where's the, the church? church? Right. Yeah, that's a normal thought. Where's the church? I mean, I see all these people dressed up in their finest clothing, finest, beautiful colored clothing, yet still many barefoot. Yep. And I see kind of like this wooden hut structure mm-hmm. with like corrugated tin nailed onto the sides and roof. And it's and I'm very confused. And all the children from the orphanage have been driven over. Yes. And their finest clothing. I know. And they A were jean so jacket. cute. And we get in there and we, we have, of course, you have Jordan with you. And then please just tell the rest of the story. No, I don't even remember. Does this little one waddle up on the side of me? Priscilla, like, yeah. So Priscilla immediately comes running over and you had been wrestling with, do we, yeah. do we add her to this yes. adoption? And I was praying about it and it was funny because like just at that moment she arrives and like holds her arms up to me. Like, and hold I, me. Yes, yeah. like I am part of this. Yeah. I am in this family. And I hold her and I have both of them and I have a picture of it. It's like my favorite picture ever. And then I think very quickly though, I could not actually like hold and sustain the two of them and maybe yeah. you took I Priscilla. I think Jordan was asleep. So I think I ended up taking Priscilla. Yeah. She ate every single snack I had out of my purse. Oh my gosh, that's my girl. And then she passed out. And then she passed out. And then I have some really cute picture of the two of them at the end of the service holding hands, walking away into the sunset together. And then I was like, "Eh, I think we need to. We get in the car to leave church and you, we had, you know, goosebump. I mean, the kind of, it's just so different. I mean, this, this kind of church is... I, yeah, let, there's no church in yeah. America that I've been to that even resembles this kind of spiritual yeah. expression, right? Yeah. I mean, it was just, and it's hours long, and I mean, it's just beautiful, and we leave. It is hours long. And I, I feel like God gave you that. The clarity and answer, yeah. Yeah, and especially when we, we walked out, Jordan and Priscilla are literally, like you said, holding, holding hands, hands, walking out into the sun, and we get in the car, and you were like, oh, I have to call Pete, and yeah. I'm I'm sure. And you called him immediately and he was like, yes. And then it was like, and then it was, there was two. Yeah, and so then, yeah, we doubled. Yeah. Well, some of the things I want to make sure we get to before we finish up the podcast are how in the world did you afford oh, yeah. to, to take two children on? Okay. So like now we're, you're two and a half years into mm-hmm. the process. Yep. And you're having these payments and now you've got a second one. So let's, for anyone who's interested in adopting, let's go through all the creative fundraising that you did. So it's important to remember that it all comes in phases. Like you don't have to pay that whole sum in one lump sum at once, right? And so if the whole process takes two years, you know, think about how much you could save on your own and like pay over time. But then think of all the things you could do as money is starting to become due. And so we've done, I mean, and and I'm going to name off things maybe that I also know friends who have adopted have done also you can do like I've got one friend that would sell barbecue like do one of those dinners from like a restaurant and then they got the proceeds from that one night was donated to their adoption we sold t-shirts we did a big dinner at like at a venue and we sold tickets and had people come and we auctioned off things from um, Jinja and had a Ugandan dinner and spoke about the adoption and that raised, I think, I mean, I can't really remember. I want to say seven to $9,000. It's really important to know that you can get grants. And so just write them like crazy. Once you write for one grant, it's pretty much the same information you're going to give. And so find ones that apply to your story and your adoption and then just keep submitting them because we got to that way. There's different places out there that give different amounts, anywhere from like $500 up to like 
8000 And also it's important to know there's adoption loans that you can get. If you get to the very end and you just can't make that last hurdle of like $5,000 or ten, you can get a loan that has no interest um, for adoption. What else? You can... Well, one of my favorite things... Look, what did that, I do that I forgot? Well, one of my favorite things is we went down to the market in Jinja and we... Oh, yeah, I sold So I emptied out my whole entire suitcase and we filled our suitcases with every piece of goods we could buy yeah. from the market. And again, these artists are local and it's... Re- when you're in country, it's really inexpensive to have purchased all of these goods. I mean, I think we had several hundred pounds yeah. of But it's helping goods. them in their economy because like Mama yeah. Flo still writes me today and is like, when are you guys coming back? Yeah. Because they and, don't get, you know, mass customers. And you connected very early on with an incredible artist. Yeah. Angelo. And Angelo's paintings went like crazy, Mm -hmm. at least in our area. Yeah. And so people were requesting Angela's paintings. Mm -hmm. And then we were like, how many, you know, Angela, we went and met Angela in a studio. We're like, how many can we buy? Like, how many can you, of these, can you paint while we're here? Four days. (laughs) And he did them. He did them for you. And we rolled up those dry canvases and we brought them back. And And then then you had... We, you had a Ugandan market. Oh yeah, we did. Several times. I forget because I was still in Uganda one of the times. Yeah. Oh yeah, you were in Uganda. We FaceTimed you, I think, but there was a big Ugandan market that then raised um, many thousands of dollars. And my church set that up or like allowed us to have the space and it was like baskets, jewelry. The paintings alone would auction or, you know, sell for anywhere from three to $500 at least. Yeah. There was a woman here um, recently in our area that was also doing an adoption and it was around Easter time and she had offered to drop Easter eggs in everyone's yards and for like $150 donation or yeah, I'm making up the price, but whatever it was. And there was like 500 people that that signed up for this. So then she got all these volunteers idea. to like schedule a route. And then so that, so instead of having to stuff your, you know, well, little listeners, you know, but you know, extra eggs on, yeah. on Easter for Easter egg hunts, besides what the Easter bunny brings. So these extra eggs, and she was able to raise almost the entire cost of the adoption. So such so creativity. get creative because here's something I just remembered. Use the resources you have and the friends, the hookups that you do have. Because I remember Pete saying, like, we have some people who are friends that roast coffee. And so we brought back all these Ugandan, I totally forgot about this, coffee beans. And then they roasted them in this special, like, you know, Joe Pre um, brand and put them in bags for us. And then we sold that. And here's the most important thing that happens. And when I say, don't worry about the money, it all just works out. I cannot tell you how many people stepped up who I haven't even seen in 20 years and would just send me checks, said, thinking of you, hope this can help. And literally the most amazing part of the whole thing and I won't say the name, is like one day we just got one of the final bills and we had no more money to give, and it was thousands. And I was just sitting there thinking, like, what are we going to do? And randomly I go into the mailbox, and there is this letter and check from a family member of a good friend from high school who said, who I had not spoken to, I mean, probably since I was a teenager, and said, my wife and I were thinking of you and have been saving up, thought you could use this. And that it was thousands of dollars and was the exact amount and covered the exact payment we needed to make at that time. Yeah. And I was like, who does that? People do that. People do that. People listening to this podcast do that. You do that. Yeah. So get creative. Remember that God is good, that people are generous. Yep. And, and if- I'm searching for things like that now. Like people will do this for you. I'm going to go out and be doing this for people who are adopting or similar things Yeah, because it's just what we need to do. Yeah. It's absolutely beautiful. So... We're going to kind of skip through the mush, but this continues on for you and Pete and Jordan and Priscilla, sadly, for another oh gosh, yeah. year and a half. Yeah, I ended up having to move over there like full time because um, this minister of gender had, you know, imposed all sorts of laws that now you couldn't do constructive fostering. If you're not living here full time and becoming a citizen, you can't adopt. And they had a time period where they were going to shut down certain orphanages and return kids to the exact spot they were taken from. And so they basically said, if you want to assure yourself that you are definitely getting to adopt Jordan and Priscilla, you need to be here in country having them live with you. So then 
We did so that. you, your company, thankfully, let you take your adoptive yes. leave early. Yep. Right. And then Pete stayed behind with your children. Yep. And then you were able to go get Jordan yes. and Priscilla and then live with them. Yep. In a, in with a this home. other family in a home that an adopted family had built for this purpose. Yeah. And it wasn't easy. It was the hardest thing in my life. I like, broke me in a lot of ways. Right. You were alone. You didn't speak mm-hmm. the language. And I wasn't with my kids. I didn't feel like I was married because, I mean, I'm not having that daily relationship with my husband. Mm-hmm. And I wasn't sure. I was. I kept being told, you know, there's a possibility you're not going to be able to get through court and bring them home. And people were getting rejected. Correct. There's plenty of people still living over there who've been trying to adopt for five, ten years. And I met them all. That doesn't make it easy. So now your children were not under 24 months old. Correct. So they're now like three. Yes. Right? And I went back and specifically read the law because I was worried. And they said had to be at the time of referral okay. to and under because I really did freak out. Yeah. Like, so three. it was literally, though, roadblock, Road perseverance, mm-hmm. roadblock, perseverance. Yeah. And at some point. You were in Uganda and it still wasn't happening and the laws were changing and pushback and and your leave was over. And I can't lose my job. I need to see my family. So you had to leave them once again and come back home. Mm -hmm. And And then where do you send them? Because they've been in an orphanage. What message does that send sending them back? And again, prayers get answered and this amazing family that had let us stay in their house and an amazing family I was living with who was also adopting in the house at the time said, like, they should stay here. And we have these aunties that work here who they've already become super close with. So so you basically ended up hiring nannies, mm-hmm. what we would call a nanny. Yeah, they call them aunties. Aunties to care for your children full time so that they yes. wouldn't have to go back to the orphanage. Correct. That they could continue living in the house. And they house. kept going to school and they could, yep. Yep. And all that. So then time passes. Yep. And one day you get a call. That says, oh, hallelujah. <laughs> four years later. Yeah, four years Four and a half years later. Four and a half years no, later. No, right? I, I think it was around three, three and a half. Of, with them, though. Oh, yeah, yeah. Not from the day you yeah. started. But. And they said, it, it was hurdle after hurdle after hurdle. Like every time, like at first, you know, they were going to clear everything and it's all through, you know, the embassy at the end takes a very long time. And then they said, are you sure that that pastor wasn't Jordan's father? You need to make sure that there are no possibilities of family members still being there who are looking for him. So they didn't want to just take the Ugandan DNA test. They needed an American DNA test. So we had to have something flown out of Emory at Atlanta. And I mean, it was like thing after thing. And finally, the embassy um, approved Priscilla and not Jordan. So then we were writing letters to our congressman and trying to get people to vouch for, you know, like to push the process along. And I will never forget when they said, um, Jordan's been approved. I got the email and I said, wow. And they came home on national adoption day, November 17th. Like what are the odds of that? Hold on. I have so much. You skipped too far oh, ahead yeah, for you, me. I was like, I cannot finish over. this story though without the airport in New York. So <laughs> now at this point, it's been many months and it's you guys all have your jobs and only one of you can go over there. Correct. So Pete goes over with some. Uh, with Samantha, my okay. niece, because the process, you can't just go for a day or two and pick them up and come home. You have to go through all of these embassy interviews. And so it takes weeks. And, and you have I to get passports. You have to get Ugandan passports for the kids. Doctor's visits. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. The medical clearance itself was a hot mess, like crazy. Yeah. And they were com- recently coming off malaria. Yeah, malaria. And also, and if they have like a drippy nose, they're like, Mm-mm, you can't take them to the U.S. And yeah. I'm like, what? Yeah. So all of this is happening. They finally get through all of it. They get on that plane for the first time with the kids and they get from Uganda to New, New York. York. And just a short flight away from New York to Charlotte. All of your friends and family have gathered at the airport to welcome Pete and Sam and Jordan and Priscilla. Like, And <laughs> we get there and all of a sudden we see at the top of the <laughs> escalator. A f- like a random stranger. <laughs> random strangers holding, holding your children <laughs> and bringing them down the escalator. And Samantha, yeah. Because <laughs> I'm dying right now. Yeah. Because... We are We're all assholes. Yeah. I'm sorry. At the airport in New York would not give up their seat on the flight 
so that Pete could come home with his children. Yeah, the not one person, not one person that was flying on National Adoption Day 2018 from the. New York to Charlotte yeah. would give up their seat. I mean, isn't that just the perfect ending? <laughs> so my two Ugandan children who have never been on a plane, I mean. Are now alone. <laughs> I, mean, this is I don't know why crazy. I'm laughing. That's evil. I don't know. I just couldn't like, you know what, jerky people out there, if you're listening. <laughs> you're ever, yeah. Give up your seat if some a parent needs to fly with their children. So we were all waiting there. And we had to FaceTime Pete in. Can I do, can I put a video on Instagram of of that? Oh yeah, sure. So I'll put a video on Instagram when this episode comes out so that everybody can kind of see. Who was the happiest? It was. We rolled around on the dirty airport floor. I mean, it was the best. And it was that so rare and random that it was on National Adoption Day. Which is what day? I don't even know. November 17th. November 17th. Oh my gosh, that's. It's goosebumpy. And what was funny is randomly um, this woman helped Sam bring them down because she couldn't carry both of them. And then later that night, I found out that it was like one of my good friend's neighbors. And they were sitting around that night talking. And this woman was like, I had the most amazing experience today. I brought these children down to an adoptive family. And my friend was like, that's Rochelle. I'd be like, and you didn't give up your seat on the flight? <laughs> maybe it was a different flight. I'm just kidding. Yeah, maybe they were coming from Chicago. Yeah, we're going to look past that part. <laughs> yes. A lot of weird signs and things lined up. So, Co-host over there, she's having a letdown. So Do you need to pump? Okay. Well, before you... <laughs> it's a birth story It's podcast. a birth story. It's okay. Yeah, we're nursing mothers. Have to pump and pee. Yeah, okay. <laughs> the two so, P's, P squared. Because my co-host... Has to, oh, there you go. But wait, was it November, November of last last year, 2018? So they've been home eight-ish months now? Yeah. Wow. And P.S. for everyone, you still have to keep doing post-adoption. Okay, that was my next question. Visits and reports. So it's not just like they're yours and you're... Correct. No. And then I'm still in the middle of getting their refinalization paperwork and their name changed. I have their social security and their insurance and stuff like that. And they have citizenship now. Do you see what's happening with Push here is that... We're talking about all of this, and as soon as we got to the finale, or like you're laying on the floor, rolling around with your babies in the airport, like she's having a letdown because that's what happens when we talk about like beautiful things that bring us oxytocin, uh, yeah, you know, and babies. So now push over here it has to come. <laughs> I mean, I, I, but hold on, before we get to the the pumping and peeing. We have just one more thing I want to leave with. So you and your husband's hearts were so big that you came home and you decided to establish a nonprofit. True. So that you could <clears throat> help fund this orphanage. Yes. And so the name is? Joe Pri. For? Joe from Jordan. And they call him Jojo there. And then Pri from Priscilla, they call her Priscilla. And we nicknamed her Pri. Okay, Joe Pri. So if anyone's like listening and loving your story and wants to connect with mm-hmm. you, like how do how does anyone find you? JoePri.org is where we run Joe Pri out of, but also we're on Facebook. And I think it's Joe Pri Uganda on Instagram. Okay. So Joe Pri Uganda or JoePri.org. And anyone can learn a lot more about Kidron Valley Orphanage in Jinja, Uganda, can kind of meet these teachers, you know, virtually. And Mm -hmm. the mission of Jopri is to be able to increase the value so that the teachers are paid a living wage because so they can stay and keep educating these kids so that they have a chance. Yeah. Yeah. And let me tell you that you can get on TV and online and you hear these things and you never know where your money's going. But like we've been there. Yeah. Right. And our board goes like every two months. Like, yeah, Amanda's going right now. We've been there. You've been there for years Mm -hmm. going through this process. Like Pastor John, these teachers. Best person I've ever known. The school. It's an incredible mission. Yep. It is to note. And we take people with us if you want to go and see for yourself. Yes. We have chips lined up. So let's do it again. I want to go again. But Pastor John and his wife, Barbara, who run the orphanage, are both orphans themselves yep. and came full circle. Oh my gosh, I never adults. really fully realized. You're correct. Yeah, they were orphans themselves. They came full circle to establish this orphanage. I'm always reminded of that starfish story, right? Like one matters. Mm-hmm. Like every single life matters. Every life matters. And so if anyone is listening to this podcast and feels led to generosity, 
then please check out joepree.org and we would love to have you on board. My book. Oh, yeah. That's coming out, Birth Story. Your adoption story is included in it because I wanted to honor it in the book. But a portion of every single book sold is going directly to Joe Pree. And I yes. hope for the sake of this orphanage, I hope I sell yeah. a million on, people. copies, two million, ten million 10 million Let's copies. Some books I don't here. even know. I hope I sell so many copies that I am able to shower this world yes. with generosity, including Joe Pree. Yes. Rochelle, thank you for being on. Push. Love you. She's dying over there. She's dying. This I'm was really fun. So, no, I, it I'm was dying, really fun. I was so thankful. So much fun. Jesus. <laughs> yeah. I got really emotional. Can I take these off? Are we done? No. Oh. <laughs> We're saying goodbye to our audience. So that let's just great. do this. If you're thinking about adopting, we're going to give you a cheer. Ready? Woo, 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 woo. You can do, do it. it. Do it, do it, do it. The money will come. You can do it. The money will come. The money will come. Generosity. Be creative. I know. Okay, we're done. Thank you for listening to our international adoption story. And Rochelle, let's go play with those babies, Mama to four. Bye, guys. Megan, Mama to five. We got to go let her pump. Okay, bye. Thank you for listening to Birth Story. My goal is you will walk away from each episode with a clear picture of how labor and delivery might go and that you will feel empowered by the end of your pregnancy to speak up 